Excellent. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Um, thanks for being here again for our fourth steering committee meeting. Um, I will share my screen real quick to show the agenda. Um, I previously sent this out along with that 33 page policy primer, uh, which will be, which we will discuss later. Uh, can everyone see my screen? Can I get a nod or a yell? Okay, I see a thumbs up. Um, so here we are now, uh, introduction and review of the agenda. Then we'll talk about uh, basically what we're doing today, uh, You know, a little bit of a uh, reminder of what we've done already, um, some roles and, and discussions. Uh, then we'll move on to really where we are in the process and all these things that are floating around right now. Uh, the student survey that finishes up the economic analysis, um, our engagement hub uh, that's live with the visioning survey um, and, and other things that are on the website, um, plus a time for questions from the steering committee. Uh, we'll go over that policy primer uh, as we uh, started to discuss earlier that um, uh, if you have any questions or any uh, things that need to be changed, it's a great time to discuss that. Um, and then we will basically finish up with uh, what's coming up, uh, including the first open house uh, that'll be at the end of November. Um, some more opportunities for engagement and, and what's going on uh, with that in the next uh, couple of weeks. Um, and then just general Q&A uh, and we can uh, revisit the role of the steering committee. Um, so that being said, I will turn it over to uh, Michael and Elaine from Clark and Hintz. Okay, great, thanks. Uh, well, I appreciate the overview. Um, but we should just jump right in. Um, in terms of uh, where we are, um, we have completed a, a review of existing documents and have provided to you a policy primer, which is what we call it, which is really um, an overview of the existing planning documents that we've been able to uh, get from uh, Princeton uh, that are the master plan. There are uh, studies that were prepared uh, for and by Princeton. Uh, that are not necessarily part of the master plan studies. And then uh, a look at what the re-examination, the last re-examination report really said. Um, and there's also an examination of things since the last uh, re-examination report that have occurred in New Jersey with respect to land use law and policy making with respect to land use that may be of relevance in considering um, how we go about uh, formulating new policies, land use policies. Um, within the municipality. Um, uh, just as an update, uh, we are continuing to work with uh, Justin's office and the municipality to uh, gather all of our documentation on existing data with respect to existing land use. Uh, we're, we're close on the existing zoning. Um, we, and in fact, I, I did include where we are with the zoning on the cover of the of the policy primer and the summary of those documents. So you're starting to get a sense of the fact that what we're talking about has uh, an application to land and land use and, and things like that. Um, so uh, we're working through uh, community facilities, information, open space. We've got historic district data. Um, we're working through the circulation data that we've gotten from the DOT and also from uh, Princeton. So we are pulling that all together and it's, we are hopeful that we will be able to uh, finalize all of the existing data into maps that can be utilized for the open house in, um, at the end of the month. That's, that's really our goal. Um, it's, uh, and so I could get to that at the end, talk about the open house. So um, what this uh, primer is really meant for is I've told you what's in it, but it's really meant so that we can focus the steering committee and any of the other deciders who are involved here on what we understand are your existing planning policy documents. And that really is the launching pad for uh, modification and new policies that may be implemented uh, or brought together within the master plan, the framework of the master plan. Um, and so um, I, I've indicated in here that these documents are hosted uh, by the municipality uh, and such that the summaries here are not exhaustive. Uh, they are meant to be summaries and to give you some guidance and to be able to be used to say, we have this and uh, here's what it generally says, but that doesn't mean that if you are very interested in a certain aspect of uh, policy that's been done or study that's been done that you shouldn't go to those existing 
documents and uh, review it in order to inform your, your guidance to us uh, with respect to policy development. David, you got a hand up? Yeah, I just, uh, you know, I wanted to um, share a couple of specific comments about the primer. Mm -hmm. I don't know if now's the right time, but- Sure, it is. So there are a couple of documents that I think, or studies that I think should be included that weren't in your list, but are comparable to other ones or were mentioned. So one mm -hmm. of them is the um, study for the uh, Prospect Ave Historic District, which is was just on this, this year. But you mm -hmm. mentioned the study for the Witherspoon Jackson Historic mm -hmm. District and right. not, uh, not that later one. Um, there's a reference in the 2017 reexamination report to the Route 206 vision plan, mm -hmm. which um, Mark could probably <laughs> tell us about because I think he was on borough council when that was done. Um, but you know, it was a <clears throat> set of recommendations that were made to to the state, which were not taken up at the time. But it was actually an award-winning design and. Uh, if you can track that down, I think um, it, it's deserving of mention as well. Sure. Um, trying to think what the other. Oh, and the Thanet, the Thanet Road uh, area in need of redevelopment. You mentioned all of our other recent redevelopment plans, but not the Thanet Road ones. So that should get listed as well. Okay. Thank you. Sure. So, um, so now that you've gone through it, are there any comments or, or, or questions or from anybody else on this? Um, how this applies? Um, or, do, or, or are you thinking that you're probably gonna need more time to process this? In, in our minds, having this body of, of understanding about uh, po previous policy direction in the town um, also uh, can be informed by the, the results of the vision study and the open houses. So uh, to the extent that uh, I don't, we don't expect you to fully react to this now, um, as you hear from the survey results and as you hear from folks uh, from the public input sessions, um, that should begin to inform how you as representatives of the municipality in this respect can um, uh, give us direction as to how these things may apply. Um, the other, the other thing to note is that while some of these uh, documents have been brought under the umbrella of the master plan, uh, some have not, and some may still have uh, relevance and, to the master plan. And oftentimes when you have these uh, studies that are um, specific and they're informative about a specific subject, but they don't really represent an entirety of a, of a master plan element, it's very often that you can adopt one as a, an appendix to a master plan or a special report and give it that, um, that basis whereby it could inform a particular element or more than one element of a master plan. So some of your recommendations may be, well, that was an awesome study. It's all still relevant. It hasn't been part of the master plan in addition to dovetailing the master plan, the, the relevant element with it, it should be adopted as a, an appendix or a special report that informs the master plan. So that could also be it. So, so I'm saying that because I don't feel, I don't want you to think you have to reproduce it as part of the master plan. If you can capture its essence in an element and then bring it in as an appendix or report, you give it that, um, that uh, stature as part of the master plan. And I'm not sure everybody understands that, but I, I wanna make that very clear. I see some heads shaking, so that's good. Nodding, there, not shaking. There are a couple of hands up too, uh, virtual hands. So. Okay, so uh, let's go from uh, the left, upper left. That's uh, Louise on our screen. Louise Wilson. Uh, thanks. Actually, I think Brian raised his hand first, but since I'm oh. upper left in your screen, I'll just take the floor. <laughs> <laughs> um, one <clears throat> thing that struck me um, about this is especially looking at the much older stuff for the strategic overview, for example, from 1996, is that at least for me and my, my personal opinion, there are some potential 
points of explicit departure <laughs> that we might uh, consider from what was uh, memorialized back then as um, guiding principles and goals. And I don't want to, um, you know, prejudge what will come out of the of the public engagement. And I want to, you know, hear that before going into what exactly those things are. But um, but I thought that that was really interesting reading through all of these um, summaries and um, uh, so I and I also was I guess I, I'm just assuming that the um, elements of the master plan that have been updated and that we've adopted more recently um, or that have been adopted by the planning board, um, you know, in the last six years or so are going to carry more weight than studies that never found them their way into the master plan, although that may not be true. <laughs> and I don't want to, you know, like prejudge that too, but that was another thing that was sort of, well, if, you know, the, the, municipality has done so many studies and there's been a ton of good work and a ton of money spent on it. And, um, you know, what are those judgment calls that are going to sort of rise to the top that we'll have to, that we um, extract from those studies that, I guess I'm repeating sort of what you said toward the end of your remarks, Michael. So maybe not very helpful. <laughs> Uh, but, but, one other study that I would add to David's uh, list of things to consider is the fairly recent one of um, dinky uh, evolutionary um, <laughs> uh, plan uh, alternative plans that were that were looked at and vetted and that ultimately the DOT made a recommendation on. And I think that that was either earlier this year or last year, but it's more recent than the other dinky related and transit uh, public transit study that you referenced. So I think it's important to, to draw that in as well. Thanks, Brian. Um, yeah, I just wanted to note from a school's perspective that there are quite a few studies and reports that have been done since 2017 and I sent the link to those to Justin, who can uh, share them with you. And I also wanted to let you know that we've um, are, at least every five years, we have to do uh, demographic projections. And we now have, uh, mm -hmm. thanks to the help of uh, the mayor and council, the most recent schedule for all of the new housing development that we know about and we will have by, November new demographic projections to look out um, five and 10 years. Great, thanks. Louise uh, is back. Kristen had her hand up, but now it's down. Uh, yeah, now it's down. Um, so I just wanted to mention uh, in response to Louise's comment, that that study is mentioned, Louise. It's on page 12. It's in the, it's the 2015 Alexander Street and University Place Traffic and Transportation Task Force. Well, what I'm thinking about was more, was presented more recently. And DOT's, DOT's plan. Oh, okay. Yeah. I that was we just this year. Plan. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. I thought we were referencing the, the work that we had done locally. And we've shared it that. Might have, it, it might have sprung from that work. Uh, it it might have built on that work, but it was it took it a step further. Sorry, Justin. No, no, I was just going to say we we've shared that with Clark and Hintz. I don't know if there's a formal report, so that might just be the reason why it's uh, not under here. But we're we're certainly keeping that, especially with the recommendation that they uh, have shown so far and how that could impact the municipality. We're certainly going to you know keep an eye on that and. and Factor that in here. Okay. And I think Jack had his hand up. Jack. Yeah, just a just a couple of, of practical comments. Uh, on the one hand, I think it's excellent. It's absolutely essential. It's practical that we do just what you gentlemen have done. The primer is a first class review of the kinds of things that have been discussed since 1996. 
obviously many of us feel that 1996 was truly a long time ago and that while that's the place to begin, it's important to understand the strengths and the weaknesses of the 1996 process, the end result. It's also important to look at how that re-examination process has unfolded. And many of us would argue that the are not only lessons to learn, but that this was not the best example of how a master plan for a town as important and complicated as Princeton should be done. Said on a more positive tone and in a more practical way even for today's discussion, fresh thinking is what the master plan is all about. In other words, by all means, let's, let's bear continuity in mind. Let's see how things have evolved. But it's very important, I would argue, that we think fresh about where we are today, what a master plan should look like, feel like, how it should work, and most of all, who should implement it and how can it be implemented in a practical way. The other question I would raise, and this is perhaps for the consultants, I've never been clear on what does the re-examination process mean? I understand we're doing a master plan, but it's been highlighted that we're also doing a re-examination. Re I just want to be clear about the relationship between these two and what our focus is as we go forward. Okay, good. I, I, you know, I, I thought that uh, someone might have that question and, and we may have reviewed this earlier, um, but I want to be, now that you have this in front of you, I think it's timely, Jack, thank you. Um, the master plan is the, the document that contains all the elements that are the underpinnings of your zoning. Summary, right? The re-examination report is a requirement by the municipal land use law that every 10 years, at least every 10 years, a municipality must conduct a re-examination report. And um, it's important to do so because if you don't do it, um, there is a presumption, albeit rebuttable, um, that your, your zoning may not no longer be valid. And that hasn't happened too often, but it happens. So there's a requirement at least every 10 years. The re-examination uh, is in the, in the land use law has a series of questions that are asked. You know, it's what were the major issues at the last re-examination? What were the assumptions? What, what has transpired since then? And what are your goals and objectives for the new master plan? Um, and you also have to identify how it relates to redevelopment areas. So there's like five questions. And it's a clunky piece of legislation because uh, there's an artful way to answer those questions without repeating yourself over and over again. When we combine a master plan and a re-examination report, we essentially have to add those questions into the discussion of policy. And that's really what this primer is doing. This is, this is reviewing those past actions since the last master plan and the last re-examination report. And it's, it's attempting to answer those questions in a way that sets the stage for policy development. So we're, we're melding them. And we will say that in the final document, it will explain that this is both. And we will point out how this document answers the statutory questions of a re-exam while also serving as a master plan. In other words, sequentially, step one is an appropriate comprehensive re-examination. Flowing out of that naturally will then come the discussion, advice and counsel on a final master plan. Is that, have yes. I got it? Yes, yes. But, but unlike a re-examination report, um, which would not serve as a master plan, you're not gonna get to the end of the re-examination, even though you're starting with that examination and we're doing it here, until the land use plan and the rest of the master plan is done, you really won't have answered all the questions. That will be the recommendations for the, the master plan. The master plan and the recommendations for the master plan are really one thing when you combine them.
Good question. Any other questions on the on the primer? I think it's important that we. Um, uh, how much? Where are we? So we're almost at two thirty. What I'd like to do is talk to uh, have a, a Susan Lickstein's office talk about the engagement hub under C, so that we can make sure we get uh, have the time with them, and then we can circle back and talk about the economic development student survey. That's okay with everybody. Um, I, sorry, Michael, for jumping in without raising my yellow hand, but um. <laughs> Just real, just real quickly back to the um, to the primer. I wrote a bunch of notes in the margin, um, and I assume that I just sort of hold on to this and tuck tuck it away. <laughs> yeah. And and as we you know as we proceed, I, I can you know the 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 like the notes in the margin, um, you know such as where are we on this and where will this go when, for example, the climate hazard vulnerability assessment, that kind of thing, is, um, is, is that correct? Yes. I, I, yes. Yeah. Yeah. That, so we're not supposed to be sort of vetting, vetting everything about this and we're, we're just, we've been yeah. introduced to it. We refer back to it, continue to write notes in the margin. I don't know, et, et cetera, but we're not, we're not putting this to bed today. We're just this is no. the end of the beginning or something with the with regard to the primer. It would it really we're really it, yes, it's it's the it's the primer, right? You know, it's priming the pump for your thoughts about policy development and new policies and as Jack said, fresh thinking, right? So now you okay. you have you have a place where you can say, oh yeah, what did we do when we looked at things in 2015 in this particular thing? You go back yeah. and you can actually jump into that document. So you, I think these should be pulled out. These are still valid and they should find their way into, let's say the conservation element or whatever it is. So, okay. so yeah, that, right. that's exactly it. Um, but I would, you know, those things that you think are gonna be important, I would review those so that you're ready when we're talking about policies to, to bring those forward. Just to follow up a minute on, on Elizabeth's comment, which I think we all appreciate, Given that there is a municipal land use law questionnaire or an approach that by law we're requested to take, can we then the steering committee expect the consultants to be setting an agenda in your best judgment of the sequencing and the nature of the questions that we should be approaching at each and every session so that all concerned have given it thought and are properly prepared. It's only two hours. And so it's important to me that we are focused and we're prepared. So, so let me say this, the primer answers most of the questions already. The, the primer is answering what, what happened since the last re-exam. You know, what did the last re-exam say? It happens, what's happened since the last re-exam? You've already answered those questions. We've also answered the question as to and we think we've answered it in a holistic manner, um, those things that have happened in the state with respect to land use and planning that may affect your assumptions. So we've already answered three of the questions okay. and we've answered what the master plan is. The fourth question is, what do we wanna do in the new master plan? That's really gonna be the policy. So what you wanna do in the new master plan is actually going to be the new master plan. And we're gonna say that in the, um, in the report. All right. Okay, if we can move on then to the uh, engagement hub and um, et cetera, website updates. Liz, you wanna start with the engagement hub? Sure, um, yeah, thank you for, we received an update to the FAQs. So that, that changed. Um, we launched the survey, I think it went up the September 16th or so. Um, so far, we have only about 136 responses. So we're, you know, we're we're hoping that everyone can help, you know, share the link um, and promote it. Um, but that's that's pretty much all that's changed on on the hub is that the survey is live and the FAQs have been updated. And we provided um, materials to Justin's office so that he's got materials that contain. Uh, the 
QR code, take the survey, multilingual um, for distribution, either through printed materials or through digital uh, means. And Justin can share those widely, we hope. I know, Justin, you mentioned that there is kind of a human services point person. Um, when we met early on um, about the social media uh, promotion and in getting it to, uh, you know, through community organizations and other groups that have their own email lists, their own newsletters, their own social media, the idea is to just keep sharing it. Um, and uh, that um, handout is uh, also something that can be shared. And uh, I know that um, though it's not in my scope, so I don't wanna be told that I'm not doing enough of it. I'm volunteering to come down sometime in the next you know, week because I wanna uh, leave them in, in certain places. And uh, I just want to um, um, also just sort of refresh uh, my experience of Princeton at the same time. So I'm gonna also bring uh, a bunch down and um, try to uh, spread them uh, within the community in the downtown and in, and in various places uh, that allow. Um, so we have smaller ones that are handouts. We can also print them eight and a half by 11 so they can be put on a, on a community bulletin board. Um, so we have uh, the ability to do both of those things, but really we wanna encourage. Um, I know, Justin, you have a lot on your plate with um, supporting the engagement. Um, so um, let us know how we can support you in, in getting all that done. Um, and we keep tracking the numbers. So if we know, for instance, that uh, you're going to be somewhere, um, you know, we can actually see the little bump in the, in the survey numbers if we know when to look for it. And that's kind of helpful for us to get a feel for when we're still bringing in uh, new responses and the timing of that. So we're early days on the survey. Um, and um, um, so we haven't looked at the results yet or even run any preliminary results. I, it's really premature uh, to do that. Um, but importantly, we will be able to do it um, in supporting uh, the team and this group in um, kind of nailing down uh, some of the focus areas uh, for the uh, open house. So that's a, maybe a separate conversation, but um, I do wanna say that of course we can run preliminary uh, results uh, when it's important to do so. Great, um, so I'd like to augment what was said uh, with some visuals, uh, Susan, if you think now's a good time. Go, please. Uh, if you see my screen, here's our engagement hub uh, that we've been talking about, engage.princetonmasterplan.org. Uh, for someone to take the survey, you scroll down to here and click take the survey. Um, this shouldn't pop up. The only reason it did was because I already took it. Um, and, and if you continue to go down here, this button uh, continues to be here, uh, which is where people could just sign up for general updates. Um, so here is the, uh, the FAQs that were discussed. Um, they were expanded upon, uh, I'm not gonna go through them all now, um, but if you go to the engagement hub, you can check them out. Um, the other thing that was referenced, uh, can you see these handouts, this graphic that I have in front of me? Okay, uh, so I got 2000 of these printed out um, and began giving, giving them out uh, at community events. Um, the YWCA Centennial Block Party, the St. Paul's Parish Fest, Friday, I'll be at the e-commuter fest. Um, there's a variety, the Sustainable Princeton's e-commuter fest, for those that don't know, um, at the Westminster site on Friday from four to seven. Uh, so really uh, I'm looking to give out all 2000 of these as soon as possible, then print out more if we got it. Um, I, I think we also have some graphics that uh, Susan was mentioning. And I think this is what uh, we can discuss how, uh, how best to put these in windows, put these on the kiosk, put them yep. all over the place. Um, I've also, and I'm gonna try to be responsible here about people's emails and names. Uh, I've been reaching out to the community groups that we've uh, received from, uh, like I said last time, from really the mayor's podcast first, uh, then followed by uh, some suggestions from steering committee members. Um, and I've also contacted our health and human services department Good. Uh, they've provided some um, 
some ways that they've reached different groups, uh, particularly throughout the pandemic. Uh, they use WhatsApp uh, and, and really neighbor, neighbors that are connectors. Uh, so I'm gonna reach out to them as well, okay. send all this information along. Um, Louise and I are gonna be at uh, the Environmental Commission tonight. Uh, I know they have some direct questions, but we're still, you know, the, the main goal is to send them to the engagement hub, get the survey filled out, get some responses there. Um, but I anticipate that we'll continue to speak with our uh, 25 or so boards, commissions, and committees, uh, particularly those with subject area expertise uh, that, you know, will feed into the uh, master plan elements, um, both so they fill out surveys as individuals and so they provide input as uh, a group or as a commission. Um, we haven't really nailed down the exact way we're going to do it, do that or, or receive that information. Um, so I, I think we need to have further discussions about how to do that, but we just know we want them to be providing information. Uh, you know, like I said, it's the Environmental Commission tonight. Obviously, that touches upon how many elements. Uh, Flood and Stormwater Commission next Friday. You know, I know we. Uh, I've spoken with the Pedestrian and Bicycle Advisory Commission. We'll speak with the Recreation uh, Board and so on and so forth. Um, so that's where we're at with getting the surveys out uh, and getting that feedback in on the um, community visioning survey right now. Mm -hmm. And I see Louise's hand is up. Yeah, I was just wondering if you would have a supply of the, you know, window posters and handout type things here at the municipal building or so that if we're going to go someplace, I'm first of all, I'm happy to help put put those things out downtown, either the day that you're here, Susan, or or any other time, Justin, that you think, uh, you know, I mean, tomorrow. Um, yeah. And because uh, I. I'm really delighted to see that long list of entities uh, that you're reaching out to. That is, that looks like an excellent list. And it makes me feel better about what seems to be an underwhelming response <laughs> so far to uh, to the survey. So I hope that number goes uh, much, much higher. But so back to my question if you'll if you have a supply here any of us can come and pick those up and you know take them to a neighborhood uh get together or to a meeting that we're going to or something like that yeah absolutely i mean like i said i have two thousand of them so let's let's get them out of my office and into people's hands um one thing i failed to mention was uh we're also uh we've been putting those uh same uh qr codes and ads on the municipal website, municipal social media, um, the newsletter, uh, the WhatsApp that I mentioned uh, next door to. And uh, I think one thing we learned from uh, the economic survey and you know, one thing that propelled us to get 4,000 responses there was that when people saw it just once, either they overlooked it, they didn't trust it, they you know, didn't do anything with it. Right. But uh, a lot of times when I heard people saw the sign, then they saw a sign in the window at the liquor store, and then they saw it in the mayor or in the the newsletter, um, that was when they said, okay, I should, I should take this thing. Uh, so we're really trying to, you know, make sure people see it in multiple ways again, uh, and then go to the website. And I see uh, Kristen, then Alvin, then Liliana. Um, yeah, 136 seems underwhelming, knowing the total number that came in on the last one. I just want to offer my perspective. I think there's confusion. Um, I think we had a robust response to the first survey and people are like, when you say, have you responded to the survey? Well, I already did that. And it takes another layer of explanation. And then they think, well, I, I'm t I, you know, I already did that. I don't want to do it. So I think there's survey fatigue and I think there's confusion. I don't know how to overcome that, but I think that's what we're dealing with. Absolutely. Thanks for, thanks for pointing that out, Kristen. That was something I heard a lot of at the YWCA event. Um, but then when I explained it to people, uh, you know, they said, oh, I understand now that was just economic. This is everything else. Um, I'll take this. So, you know, I'll continue to do that when I see people either at these virtual events or in-person ones. Uh, but if I give out the cards and, and any of you receive that question, if you could 
pass that along. I think that'd be very helpful too. Have we written a letter to the editor in the town topics to explain that? Uh, we have not. We have not yet. Um, I, I'm working with uh, our communication staff here to uh, send out press releases, um, but we could also. Uh, I think it'd be a good idea to double up. You know, have an article and an op-ed in there. I, I just think it was effective when I think Louise, you and and Tim had written a letter early on in the process clarifying roles. Um, and um, I don't know, I think lots of people read the letters to the editor and it's an unfiltered um, opportunity for us to speak to the community and just very simply explain that we thank you for your robust responses to the first one. This is phase two and we really need your responses now. Very simple. Mm -hmm. Great idea. And I'll work with Louise on that. Great, thank yeah. you. Yep. And I see Alvin uh, with your hand up. Yeah, yeah, I do. Um, one I have in, in related to what Kristen has said. Um, why don't you take out a full page ad in the paper uh, and sort of use that as boil it down and explain what's going on? Because I I'm getting the impression that that they're not that as far as just the general public goes, there's just not much of an awareness of of really of what's going on. Um, and sort of related to that, I guess I'm also worried that you now have the survey launched and you're going to have a certain date for it to end, but you haven't, again, gotten out all the information. Here's how you need to, re to respond to this. And by the time by the time you get that done, the survey will be almost be, the, the date for the survey will, will, have, will have come. So I, I'm thinking that those are sort of my, my, my concerns. Yeah, I think that's a great idea with the ad too. And that's something we, you know, I think one, now that I've heard 136 responses, we're gonna have to do that. Um, I don't know if Susan or Michael wants to talk about uh, the end date and how that's gonna work. Um, Go ahead, Susan. Okay. Um, well, one thing that we're obviously going to do is is keep an eye on on responses. Um, we definitely want to uh, run the survey, um, preliminary result results, whatever we have, uh, at least a few weeks in advance of that first public workshop, maybe even sooner, so that we can at least suss out, you know, what what we're hearing so far. That can be helpful in planning uh, for the open house and in working with you all. Uh, to sort out what focus areas you want to um, create uh, with the open house. And that's something we can talk about a little bit uh, later on. Michael and Elaine and I have, and, and Liz have already di discussed that. Um, so it's something we're going to keep an eye on. But I can tell you that, you know, we're not going to uh, close the survey in two weeks. This is not what we're talking about. So uh, we're going to give it time uh, to get into the community. Um, we're going to give it time to what we call get an echo, which is that seeing it in more than one place and hearing about it in more than one place. Um, and we're going to be mindful of that. So we, you know, that's all part of what we're going to be doing. Um, I did not anticipate that we would, um, on November 30th, uh, if I'm correct, uh, Michael and Justin is the current working date for the uh, first uh, open house. Correct. Um, so uh, we have time to be promoting this. And even at the open house, uh, we may have uh, a little area where we have uh, some highlights uh, from what we've heard from the survey, but it doesn't mean that we absolutely have to close it out you know, two weeks before that meeting. So we have some flexibility, that's the good news. And we're gonna take the time and work with you all uh, to get the you know, promotion right uh, Justin, we can get you uh, the higher quality graphics, whatever you need for purposes of uh, working with the paper or other entities. Um, so we have the ability to, to give you all of that information. Um, so yeah, we're gonna work on it together and figure it out and, and push as hard as we can. The one, one thing I'll say that's a little bit different than a consumer or an economic survey, um, is that we do need your all of your help and the community organizations, Justin, that you're reaching out to, 
to, to get a little bit of excitement about, you know, a visioning survey is, is, a, is a higher level survey to sort of understand uh, the, the key concerns, issues, and potential priorities that people have. Um, and um, I want people to understand that it's for a first of two uh, community surveys that we're going to be doing. So there was an economic survey. There's this community survey, which is a little bit at a, at a higher level. And then we're going to come back uh, with a survey that is more focused uh, after uh, the team uh, holds open houses, reviews information, has more discussions with this group about you know, potential uh, ideas, then we have an opportunity to go back and have uh, a more focused uh, kind of survey. So this is why we really want to drive traffic to the hub and get people to sign up there. Uh, that's the ideal situation because then we have their email address and we can communicate with them. One of the things that we're working on is uh, we have the ability to just direct send an email from the hub. Um, and we have, a, I think, about 200 uh, email addresses for people that have signed up for updates. Um, so we will uh, work with Justin and send out uh, an email. If you haven't taken this, the community visioning survey, please take it. Um, and we can even explain in that that it's obviously something different than the um, uh, economic survey. So we're going to try to use all those tools together and um, to address you know, what we're hearing and what we're seeing in the way of response. I will say that this time of year is a little, uh, there is some social media wariness that happens once the school year starts anyway. Um, and a little bit of, 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 of kind of uh, maybe a little bit of traffic that we're gonna have to kind of keep um, pushing through. Um, so we're gonna work with Justin and you all to do that. Hey, Justin, Lil Lillian has had her hand up for a while. So I don't know whether she got moved to another screen, but. She's top left now, so she's. Oh, I see you there. Yep, okay. Liliana, if you'd like to speak. Hi, so for the English, you know, as a second language um, group that I kind of represent here, it's I'm thinking like, uh, the, uh, like for instance, little groups that like the Princeton um, Mobile Food Pantry that we deliver to more than a thousand people every other week, or you know, groups like Share My Meals or Cornerstone, all those people we can have like flyers that we can put in each order. And, um, and you know, just to encourage people to keep, um, to keep us, uh, you know, to keep, um, expressing themselves and also what I do in all these uh, I have little I have chats like 700 people here 800 people there in uh, for for them it's very important the visuals so I don't know if there's if you have any sort of like a little YouTube not long and not fancy is like this is important because you will be heard because you will have options for more housing or for this or for that like only that, if that could be like, if, if I could have that, I really could kind of, uh, exp you know, expand it more. Liliana, I'm sorry, this is Elaine. Would you be willing to record that? Sure. That would be great. I don't see any reason we wouldn't be able to distribute it. I mean, I do it like I did it in, well, I keep doing it of how to do the, 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 the home, um, what COVID thing. I've done it for, I mean, of course, they're, they're done seeing me, so that'd be great. <laughs> I, I think that would be great. I see no reason why we couldn't use that and maybe post it somewhere on the hub, all kinds of places if that were available. So I would okay. encourage you to record that. And if you would do it in English and Spanish. Sure, with my accent, yeah. yeah. <laughs> you sure. might, it might require a little bit of coordination so that the, you know, the survey, um, and this particular survey and, and what it focuses on is sort of made clear. So, um, because I think at least my people are confused, like, okay, if I, you know, please do it and they, they do it, but then it's like, and then I have to do it again. So I think it's like, um, they're a little confused and I think it will be easy just to see it, just to see why. Hmm. Okay, great. So Susan, if you want to put together, you know, two well, or three we can talk about it offline, Elaine. That's okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Liliana. And uh, Michael, I saw Michael Sullivan, your hand has been up. 
Yeah, no, it's mine. Um, it's actually and, late. And it's just real quick. I want to emphasize again how very important it is to keep track of all these outreach efforts. And I don't know the best way to do that. I'm thinking it's probably going to be one more thing for Justin to worry about. But we do want to document that in the final plan. So it would be important to be able to say we made these kinds of outreach efforts. We reached this number of people, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so Justin, your spreadsheet that you, that you show, that is great. I and mean, if maybe it's just adding to that, but I do want to emphasize how important it is to track the outreach. Absolutely. Yeah, there were a lot more columns to that uh, that we didn't need to get into today. I think it went <laughs> up to X. X by now. Of course. Uh, and I see Christine with her hand up and then Emma and then Alvin. Thanks. Um, so we plan on putting uh, something about the survey in our newsletter this week, um, and we'll continue to promote it. We'll start promoting it on social media to help drive up the numbers. Um, and at the eCommuter Fest this uh, Friday, we have some really good raffle prizes. So we, if people get a passport stamp by visiting Justin's table, they get an entry into the raffles to help drive traffic there. But Justin, you might need help. Is there anyone from the steering committee that might want to uh, be there at the table with you? Um, I'll be a little occupied, but I don't want you to be overwhelmed. Um, and we're also going to have a videographer there. So we could have them stop by and do a little video of you, Justin, that you could use for promotion of the master plan. Absolutely. And before anyone, before anyone commits, because I see a microphone's coming off, uh, the event is from four to seven. Um, I'll be there the whole time. I'll be there for setup and takedown. Uh, so if anyone wanted to stop by, even if it was for 10, 15 minutes, um, you know, I I'd gladly have you. I'll be there to help for an hour or so, Justin. Just can't tell you exactly when. Okay, excellent. And I see Louise as well. Thank you, Christine. Uh, and Emma? Hey. Um, I just wanted to make a quick comment about the survey and the end date um, that we were just discussing. Um, I think it would be really beneficial, even if there's no set end date, to mention like a loose end date, like, uh, you know, open for the month of November or closing end of November. Um, it doesn't have to happen right away, but it could follow that echo and that push um, for people to fill out the survey. And, you know, I know we already have flyers and brochures printed. So this, the the date is great to include in uh, like digital and social media announcements because it could always be edited. Um, but that will create a sense of urgency because I just know that a lot of people are prone to pushing it off. As we said, they need it to have exposure like three, four times before they actually think to fill it out. But if they see it two, three times, and then they also see like closing in three weeks, then they might be more, um, likely to fill it out and not keep pushing it off. So that's just a simple thing that actually might influence people to fill it out on the earlier end and not miss it. Um, and then also with that desire to drive traffic to the hub and get people to sign up, um, I guess you could think about including that call to action of people, you know, recommending people sign up for the newsletter to get updates, to not miss that second survey that is built off of their responses from the first survey. Um, you want them to stay engaged and see like, okay, how am I making this impact? So if they are filling out that first survey, um, they want to know when that second survey is out and see, you know, how maybe their responses were, you know, uh, considered. That's we will, We those are great, I, that's fantastic. And we will, um, some people are giving us their, there's an optional place where you can provide an email in the survey as well, correct, Liz? So some people are giving us their, 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 their addresses there, and we're mm -hmm. also able to pull those. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. You know, so once we, and this is the value of getting people to sign up, because then we're able to have more direct communication along the way uh, for all kinds of, uh, you know, outreach efforts. So mm -hmm. thank you, that's, that's very yeah. helpful. And I'm definitely in, you know, my own outreach going to uh, mention that, I think it was you who mentioned that definition of the visioning survey and how it's different from the economic survey. I think that's for the public, I think that's a really good thing to mention how it's like a higher, higher level survey, uh, you know, focusing on like the concerns and priorities of, you know, the people. 
Absolutely. Thanks, Emma. And I think um, with the way that that survey came out, it not only, you know, by leading it with the economic survey, it kind of caused confusion, um, especially with the yellow signs, but it also set a really high bar with those 4,000 responses. So we definitely have to do what we need to do to, to get higher than that. Um, and Alvin? Um, uh, some more, I guess, specific questions. Now, Justin, you're planning, say, to meet with a community group. So if, say, Witherspoon Jackson organized a community meeting, you would you would be the one to come to the meeting? Absolutely. But I would love it if, you know, I had someone connecting me there, too. So, if, well, yeah, you know, but uh, one you, of the you would. And, and, yeah, I would. Yeah. And, and the discussion would be about um, the vision, strictly the visionary, the, you know, the vision planning. Um, would it include generally what's, what, what this, this process is? And um, how does this differ, if at all, from, from an open house that you're also going to have later on? Or is this going to be something in addition to an open uh, I think house? Right now, uh, what we're looking to do is tell people about the master plan process, um, then also direct them to the engagement hub which includes that survey by mid-October and then the open house. So not necessarily getting into the weeds about, you know, hey, come to the planning board meeting in July of next year. Um, but, you know, here's where we are right now. And here are what we're asking of you in the next, you know, two, three months. You said survey by mid-October. Yes, this community vision survey. Right now we have it as mid-October. Um, okay, although it would still be going on until maybe... November? We're going to, listen, we're going to track it. Um, what we originally uh, had laid out was about six weeks, but um, there were some extra rounds of review uh, on the survey. And uh, so it went live on the 16th. So if we look at six weeks, um, that's about what we were gauging initially, but we're going to have to keep an eye on it. So I don't want to say that's set in stone, but I think that we can at least encourage people to do it um, you know, before, before late October and, uh, and then see how we do. We also, and I didn't get a chance to say this, we actually um, suggested in our social media instructions to Princeton that once you get closer to the close date, that you also start a little uh, more frequent, you know, pushing out. So we do, we, in the beginning, we want to push out more and then we go to a little bit of a more moderate pace. And then as it gets closer to the end, we start pushing out with greater frequency. So that is encapsulated in what um, we uh, provided in the way of you know, promotional strategy. Um, I apologize that, that both Liz and I are gonna need to, to hop off. Uh, I have a couple, of, I'll stay on for a couple of minutes, um, but I'm sure that Mike, uh, will relay to us anything that we need to, you know, think about further and get back to you all about. And Alvin, like we said, the open house is scheduled right now for November 30th. So, you know, we're not trying to shut this on November 29th, but we do have some flexibility between mid-October and the end of November uh, to extend it. And, you know, if, like I said, today it's 136 responses. If next week it's only 200, then I think that's gonna be pretty telling. And I see Liliana and then Louise. Yeah, question, who's reaching the seniors? I mean, ha Justin, have you gone to Elm Court, Elm uh, Griggs Farm, uh, Writing Circle? There are a ton of people there. Uh, the only thing is they don't have access to email. And, um, and I mean, they would need to be heard. Yeah, I've reached out to uh, some of the contacts we have uh, at the different housing uh, facilities, um, but we, you know, I haven't gone in person yet. Uh, I would love to, you know, if they have a monthly meeting um, or anything like that, I'll, I'll reach out again. But if anyone here has any information, that'd be very helpful too. Okay, I'll, I'll do my best, okay. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. And Louise? Uh, maybe not a fair question to ask of Susan uh, at uh, 258, <laughs> but, I would like to hear your thoughts about the format for the um, for the open house, since that's on the agenda, and um, maybe that's you know 
you can speak real quickly to it now and then I'm happy more to. information to look at offline or something. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm happy to. Um, but we have been talking uh, within our, within the broader team about um, is uh, an open house. Uh, and, and my understanding is that the library would be uh, the location. And I, I don't know, Justin, if you've nailed that down or, or what else needs to happen. But um, what we generally do is we have a sign in area and some background information on, uh, on a master plan, uh, maybe some recent trends. We kind of warm people up <laughs> with some general information. But really, the guts of the open house are three to five, I'll call them like focus area stations. Um, and they can be uh, by topic, by geography. Um, and, um, you know, for instance, we've, we've done uh, master plan open houses where we have uh, one on the downtown, where we have one on kind of a main shopping destination. In this case, it might be the shopping center uh, where we have residential districts uh, in another one, redevelopment areas. I mean, there, there are different ways to structure it. Um, and we're not necessarily the content experts here, um, but what's important is that they're designed uh, to be interactive so that uh, people are um, uh, providing uh, input on what they're, what they're looking at, what they're seeing, uh, what they wanna see, um, and that there is you know, mapping and other supportive materials needed for that to happen. Um, and the ideal, the uh, way that we structure them is we set aside typically three hours and people go through at their own pace. So you don't have to be there for two and a half hours. You don't have to give up your entire evening. Um, we like to start a little bit on the earlier side. Usually at four, we will get some uh, after school um, uh, uh, people coming from after school from picking up kids, which is great. Uh, and we'll usually try to run it for, for at least three hours. Um, so our idea is to set it up so that the team members are at those focus areas and they can actually talk to people and have more substantive interaction uh, with people who are, who are attending, um, can understand uh, their concerns. We also would have a comment station where people can write you know, also uh, any additional comments uh, that they want. So it's set up kind of like a, uh, a sign-in station, kind of an overview station, and then usually by focus area. And um, we allow people, you know, and, and it also helps us spread people out. I will say that we did one of these, um, we had one planned and then the pandemic came and believe it or not, we had to like have everybody six feet apart, which was like fascinating in a room trying to do this. So you can picture how fun that was, but um, it also works out well because of the uncertainty uh, with some issues like that. We don't have to keep people all kind of you know, clumped together. It gives us a little bit flexibility in terms of uh, numbers. So that's generally what we, uh, how we set up the open houses. And I think that the primer is um, a starting point and I'll leave it to uh, Michael and Elaine who are more of the content experts here on those focus areas and which focus areas um, do you want to um, uh, incorporate into the design uh, of this uh, first open house. And hopefully in a few weeks, we'll have at least more survey, hopefully much more survey responses and we can kind of get a glimpse of what we're hearing and uh, we can share that with you as well. So that's, I hope that's enough information, but generally our experience is people can, some people will spend 10 minutes in the whole thing. Some people will spend 20, some people will spend longer. Um, um, but that's generally what the open house format uh, is like. I, I would just encourage you, encourage you when you're picking um, and choosing about focus areas, uh, definitely keep mm. Justin in the loop. And and oh, when you're yeah. close to deciding, Justin, maybe you share that um, with the mm -hmm. steering committee and get some feedback on. I the, am. Yeah. I already know from Michael and Elaine yeah. that you guys are all going to be involved in helping yeah. to identify them. That's exactly, that's exactly right. This is not us deciding. This is yeah. us deciding. I'm just trying to give you the lay of the land. If you have more than three to five, it's 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 tends to be too much for people. Yes. So so yes. the trick is prioritizing right. um, and that I will leave it to all the all of you who are experts on the community to um, 
sort out. Great. Very nice seeing everybody briefly. Thank you, Susan. Thanks, Susan. Bye-bye. Uh, and one other thing I, I'd like to mention before we move on from this topic or before we get to questions, um, I've also uh, been working with the library to do something with them to cross promote, um, you know, maybe put some of their planning books to the side and put a social media post about it and all that. And I, I'd love to do that with as many community groups. That'll kind of be the first one. Um, and then secondly, uh, we've been able to piggyback off of a, a contract that the engineering department has uh, with a, a Spanish interpreter. So for those first two events, uh, we had an interpreter there, um, as well as some staff members who are willing to help with this uh, that are who are bilingual. Uh, so we'll continue to do that as much as possible. That's awesome. That's great. Um, we skipped over the, the student survey. So can we uh, touch base on that? Sure, absolutely. Um, so I've been working with the university um, and they've been working with the uh, the undergraduate student government to get the word out about the student survey. Um, by way of reminder, it's the final piece of the economic analysis, which is a piece of the economic element. Um, uh, like uh, Joe Getz presented last time, uh, his preliminary findings, once we get this final piece, uh, he can make the, the full economic analysis. Um, we've received, I believe, 54 responses thus far. Uh, I don't know what our target is there, but uh, you know, it's actually higher than that, Justin. They got a, quite a few last night. I think they're up to about, I'm going to say either 160 or 260, and I'll check that. But no, we were told, we were, last night that we were told we were told you wanted 100. <laughs> 100, 100 was my statistical guess based okay. on uh, so, Joe's 400 uh, for the so, whole municipality. So we're, we're way past that. 260. So, one so far total since September. Two, six, one. Yes. Okay, so that that um, equates to the approach that um, my student contacts told me they're going to take. They've launched an initiative this week um, with a program called Tigers in Town, where students are um, <clears throat> able to have coffee and treats and things as part of um, you know continued outreach into the community. And they were promoting the QR code for the survey at the time when the students came to pick up their QR code to get their, you know, you know, pass to go to one of the local businesses. So um, this is what the students had told me would work and it is, it is working. So I'm glad to hear that. And that's, this great. initiative runs all week. Great. great. I emailed the link to a friend who's doing his master's. He's in the School of Public Policy and he said he had already filled it out. So that was proof uh -huh. to me too that I was working and I was like, how did you know about it? And he said it was all in all the group season. So yeah. I don't know if that's group me, you know. Yeah, they were putting it in the grad student Slack. Right, right. And, and it was also, uh, Kristen pointed out, it was in a article in the Princetonian um, about the student government meeting. Um, I, I think, and that had the link. So I think that probably drove some traffic. Um, and, you know, I, I've reached out to the Princetonian for a full article if they're interested in that. Yeah. Again, it is really important to keep track of how this was done so that we can let Joe incorporate that into his report. On the topic of students, um, including this friend who I reached out to, I think especially in the School of in Public Policy, some of these students are interested in getting more involved. Um, so I just wanted to put it out there in case you know of future opportunities where um, some of these master students could Kind of practice, I guess, what they're learning with you know the town and the master yeah. plan. Yeah, I I would love that, and I'll put a you know a a plug out right now. Um, I have a <laughs> uh, high school intern starting tomorrow that's going to help out. Um, I have a graduate student paid intern that's coming soon. We just had that posted, and I would love to to split the difference and have an undergraduate one or another graduate one. Um, any okay. help, any hands we could get would help. So. Okay, because I also saw um, in this, uh, you know, packet that there's new committees forming, um, maybe later in the fall. So I didn't know if that also might be an opportunity to get more voices. Okay, yeah, we'll have to look into that definitely. Yeah, yeah, I'm just putting it out there. Yeah. Okay. 
All right, so after the student survey, what haven't we talked about? We, we talked about the open house, so we're good. We talked about the engagement of okay. the open house, so that, yeah, no. that needs to be promoted. Um, so the other upcoming opportunities, I think, is the next thing. You want to pick up on that? Yeah, yeah. So um, we we are uh, looking to schedule a meeting with the open space manager and the open space recreation committee as part of our, our uh, specific outreach about um, uh, their needs. And that'll feed into uh, what we end up. I'm thinking the open house, there may be a focus on open space and recreation, but we're not sure. But as part of our uh, engagement, we are, are going to reach out to them and hopefully be able to have that meeting prior to the open house in the, in the survey so that the, we have those recommendations uh, and any of their input, preliminary input, recognizing it's at the beginning of this process there. Um, we're also uh, going to schedule a, a meeting with the Board of Education Long Range Planning Committee. We just heard um, that uh, they have more information coming out and what they're anticipating as far as demographics. So. Um, I think it's important to understand what they're thinking in terms of uh, school facilities uh, and how that might feed into the community facilities aspect of the master plan. Um, and uh, so, so those two are coming up. I'm going to be working with Justin to, to help schedule those and with the contacts. Um, we talked about the second open house, which is after the second survey. Um, other community group meetings, we've, we've touched on that. Justin, you're out there, uh, you know, beating the bushes here and uh, showing up and getting people to engage. Um, one of the things that we talked about uh, was that uh, if you maintained a Google calendar of your meetings, then we could embed that on the uh, in a way that you maintain it, but it's updated there automatically. So if somebody is uh, signed up for the engagement hub or they go there, they can see when those community meetings are, are happening and uh, and also um, any of the other meetings that we have, the open house, the you know the, the two open houses, if we're having a planning board meeting that would be on there as well. So um, we you know we're happy to to get that started, but that it, it's simply a met, um, a matter of embedding it in the engagement hub and that calendar being maintained uh, by you. So, Yep, and I already have that going on Outlook, so it'll be easy enough to switch it over to Google. Okay, good. Um, and we we cleared that with the with the folks who are yeah. dealing with the engagement. Yeah, all we need is the embed code, and for you to set that calendar to public, and we can get that done. All right, will do. Right. Um, so moving on to other issues, um, we had a conversation uh, among. Uh, Louise and I, and I believe Justin, about uh, that there are these other uh, groups within Princeton, there are task force and other folks, and what the relationship between the steering committee and those folks is and how you want to engage them. So, um, you know, while we're, you know, you're our principal engagement point and Justin is our, you know, administrative engagement point, um, we don't have uh, an interface with all those committees and things. So, um, we put it on here so that there could be a discussion about uh, how the you think the steering committee should relate to those other entities and how to generate um, input and engagement from it. <laughs> let me let me jump in and say that that captures sort of part of what we wanted to accomplish um, with this conversation. I've just um, heard from folks that there still is some you know, potentially some confusion about how the steering committee relates to the master plan subcommittee of the planning board and the planning board itself. And then that sort of gives rise to, well, what about the board's commissions and committees and all these other, you know, important institutional and organizational stakeholders around town. Um, and what I think would be helpful um, in the next few weeks would be to um, work with our consultants and with and with our own um, uh, in-house in the municipal building communications people and uh, and come up with a visual <laughs> this sort sort of shows the the players show it explains the process and where um, plug-in points uh, 
are and how the um, how the steering committee is uh, gathering and you know listening and and reaching the public and synthesizing information and coming up with recommendations, um, starting with the goals and principles and stuff, excuse me, and stuff, the, the goals and principles that are so important <laughs> to the, um, uh, to how the, all of the elements are structured. Um, and then once the, steering committee is close to finishing its work, then the master plan subcommittee of the planning board will take those, um, take the work products and the recommendations, address any, um, uh, and, and, and try to resolve any issues that the steering committee simply can't reach consensus on and then pass along a set of recommendations to the planning board, which then has a series of public hearings, makes final amendments itself, and then adopts the plan. So um, I, I think it would be great if people um, have questions right now about how all of this will play out and work and how the different entities relate to each other or we can sort of wait until there's a, a visual representation and then kick the tires on that. Cause I think it would be helpful to have something, uh, I'm a visual person, so I'm just projecting, <laughs> uh, to have something for the, all the stakeholders and the, and the general public being an important part of that stakeholder um, scenario to see on the um, engagement hub, uh, and and understand, you know, again, how this process plays out, you know, in the coming months and into next summer, presumably with um, once we, you know, get hearings uh, underway. So I hope I didn't just add to the confusion, <laughs> um, but I but I I do understand, you know that. This process is somewhat different than master plan exercises have typically been done in New Jersey. And Michael and Elaine both have a lot of experience with that and Justin too. And I have some experience and maybe others here do as well. But you know, typically there's a pretty small group of deciders. Um, and yes, you do go through the process of gathering um, public input, um, but this process that we have where there are there's the steering committee with that's a combination of people who have a lot of inside knowledge um, and other people who have less inside knowledge but offer an enormous um, you know enormously valuable perspective and an ability to reach a bunch of people who are not the usual suspects um, it is a really different way of trying to pull together um, a visionary and as someone pointed out earlier, genuinely different, better uh, community master plan. And I don't say that to throw shade on the last master plan or any elements we've adopted since then, but just to say that um, we're facing different types of, of issues. We have a public that's interested in obtaining information and digesting it differently. And it's just going to be, you know, we don't want to have the same old work kind of work product. So, um, so it's understandable that there's confusion <laughs> about, you know, how this group works um, and its relation to the master plan subcommittee and to the planning board. Um, and I think this meeting today has been really good at sort of uh, an example of how different people bring different perspectives that aren't typically represented in a, you know, sort of small insider group steering committee. Um, so I'll stop there and say if folks have questions, um, you know, between 
me and Justin and Michael uh, and others, I'm sure we'll try to address them. But the reason that I jumped in and sort of took the wheel on this <laughs> is because um, the, the structure of the steering committee um, was, was an intentional decision early on and a departure and something that I uh, take responsibility for <laughs> or credit or blame or responsibility and uh, not for, for the outcome because I think that's way early and it's not supposed to be you know, any one person's plan, obviously, um, but for the, the structure of this um, process. And so I'll stop there. Any, anyway, are there are there lingering questions about who's doing what or <laughs> how this all works or uh, anything like that 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 might help us to Sam, I see your hand up. Yeah, I don't know if this is a question about um, who does what. Do you have other material that you want to cover today or is it kind of a very general question? Uh, I personally do not. Okay. I again wanted this as a sort of under other issues, role of steering committee in relation to other entities. This is uh, so the other things to cover today include the combination of the October 26th meeting and November 30 meeting and uh, an open house uh, in December. I don't know about other things people might want to cover today. I see uh, David's hand. Louise, we could get those last things taken care of pretty quickly. They're just administrative. So if that would be useful, we could get that done. Right. Um, and then people who want to hang out for the larger discussion can certainly do that. Right. Um, because the... Is that what you were getting at, Sam? <laughs> yes, exactly. Is that yeah. a move on I don't want to bore people with questions. I think, yeah, I, think yeah, yeah. Should, I think I agree. I think you should cover those things. And Okay, yeah, great. Yeah. All right, so because the first open house wound up being exactly on the day of a steering committee meeting, we realized that obviously wasn't going to be possible. Um, so we are recommending moving that November steering committee up to November 10th, by which time we'll have a preliminary outline from JGSC, we'll have some preliminary survey results from Susan, and we'll be able to structure, we'll spend that meeting structuring the focus areas for the open house. Correct. Um, Thought it made sense from a timing standpoint yeah. of the survey and the open house to shift it. Yeah, and I understand it's a different date than other people had on their calendar, but that was the date that seemed to work. So if you're available, please put it on your calendar unless there's some objection to that date, we'll count on it. And I uh, Yeah, uh, I'd just like to add, I, I'd like to send a doodle poll out about that to get people time rather than assuming two o'clock on a Thursday works. Okay. Yeah, that's a good idea. All right. Great. Um, Thanks. But we would like it, it almost has to be that week, Justin, just because the week after is the league and the week after is Thanksgiving. Yeah. Well, no, no, I, I'm fine with that date, assuming mm -hmm. everything goes well, but I just want to offer up okay. uh, some different times. So. Okay. Okay. Um, and then the question is, on the calendar, the next steering committee meeting, would be after the open house right after Christmas. So I don't know if we want to keep that on the calendar. Or I don't think we have to decide it today, <laughs> but I wanted to highlight that, that maybe that's not a meeting we need and we push it off to sometime in January. And again, we don't have to decide that today. It's just it's just for notice. We had talked about this a while ago that this, this may be a <clears throat> it shifted. So. so those were the only other administrative things we had on the agenda. Great. David. Do we want to get into questions then? Going back to Sam, then to David and Kristen. Yep. David, do you want to go first? Well, I I just wanted to comment uh, about that late December meeting. You know, if the open house is on the. By the way, this is not why I had my hand raised, but I'm commenting on it since we're trying to get through the administrative stuff. Um, you know, if the open house is on November 30th, I think it's really long to wait to have a follow-up meeting until after the new year. After Christmas, that week, you know, often is kind of a lost week. So I, I guess I'm suggesting maybe we can move up 
that December meeting similar to the way that we're moving up the November meeting? We'll look at we'll look at dates. Okay. If that, yeah. Yep. And then I'll let Sam go with his other questions, and I'll keep my hand up because I do have another comment question. Okay, so I want I just wanted to ask some questions about the process because in trying to promote the the current survey, which has light participation, I'm trying to understand exactly how the survey um, informs the overall process of writing the master plan. So uh, one question that I have is that the, the questions in the survey seem quite general, and I'm struggling to understand how you get from the, the quite general questions which are in the survey to the extremely granular document which makes up the master plan. The master plan, at least the current master plan, has a number of different elements, and those elements really get extremely specific in terms of detail. Um, and I just, I just, I just, I'm struggling really to see how um, the, the existing survey can get you to that level of detail. Um, so maybe you can comment on that. I think, I think if I understand correctly, what's going to happen is there's this current survey, which is the second survey. And based on that survey, we're going to identify topics which will be explored in greater depth at a community meeting on November 30th. And then based on the outcome of that community meeting, there will then be another survey in the new year, which will be the third survey, which will potentially drill down in more detail into perhaps more specific topics. And then potentially based on that third survey, then the consultants will write something. Is that right? That's generally correct. And the, and, the, and the initial, this vision survey is meant to be very general and it's meant to be able to identify those areas of focus and to inform uh, us as consultants and also the steering committee when we are looking at uh, policy development and identifying those larger issues. So you've laid it out exactly the way we've uh, structured it in terms of the um, process. All right. How All right. you get from the general to the granular is, uh, I mean, gen that's the way master plans work. You start with the general ob objectives and policies and things, and that is translated into let's zone this specific area for X lot sizes, or let's put uh, a community building on this site. Um, and But it starts with the question of, do we need more recreation facilities? Then, okay, what are those recreation facilities? So that's how it happens. Um, so I hopefully that answers your question. Well, it does, but can, can, can you perhaps um, draw that out a little further? So how about this, if I, if I give a very specific example. Sure. So let's consider the Westminster Choir College site. So there's a strong chance that that site is going to be redeveloped in some capacity, obviously depending on the outcome of various litigations. So, you know, one thing that the master plan might do is provide a framework for uh, what kind of redevelopment might be allowed on that site. Right. Correct me if I'm wrong, perhaps that is beyond the scope of the master plan, but that would strike me as the kind of thing that a master plan might do. So how would we get to a point where the master plan might be able to do that, to give a, a granular overview of uh, what might happen on the Westminster Choir College site? Well, Can I take that? Sure, go ahead. Um, I'll start by saying, you know, survey will have very general questions about development and redevelopment and what are the issues that people think about most. And given that, a second survey might ask specifically about certain areas in town and what people might want to see in terms of different types of development in those areas. And that, again, would be the discussion that could happen at a second open house. And based on that, recommendations would be made as to right. what should be encoded in order to in order to enable that right and, and and one of the things that is important and you've said that there's there's some some master plans are extremely specific and there's certain specificity that's required uh for instance you should be able to give general general uh densities or land lot sizes or things like that 
but it doesn't have to be hugely specific. And a lot of times we'll write master plans or land use plan element particularly, and we'll give a range of a density or we'll give a range of lot sizes or, or something like that because we want to give the flexibility for the regulations, the legislation, the zoning that occurs to make sure it doesn't become out of sync with it when that happens. Because a lot of times you may not be able to dial it in exactly during the master plan. So you may have some flexibility in there. So that's how that happens. But in, in, in a place that's maybe it's a you know lightning rod like Westminster, um, that probably will demand more specific and more um, uh, focused review. I would think that that would be something that people look at and they say, boy, I really want to know what's going on here. And the master plan could say, well, you know, we think that the, the density here should be between X and X units per acre if it's residential. Uh, we think that the, the scale of development should reflect the existing context at some level. And, um, and it should be zoned for, let's just say residential and, and, uh, and industrial, well, just as an example. It could be that general and it gives a flexibility. So when you do the redevelopment plan, now you roll up your sleeve and say, okay, are we gonna do a redevelopment plan? Are we gonna do an RFP for a redeveloper? And the redeveloper is gonna give us a plan and we're gonna say, okay, let's write the regulations to fit that. So there's lots of options that way. But every, every part of your community is not gonna have the, the degree of focus and intensity that that would. And those are the kind of things that can be elevated in the discussions to have more focus on it, so. Okay, I had one more um, specific question and there's a couple of very quick comments. So the question, a further question that I had was, I, I was under the understanding that there was going to be some kind of social media hub where people could go online and, and leave comments. Uh, I haven't seen anything like that. Have I just got the wrong end of the stick on that one? Is, is that not gonna happen? The, the the engagement hub is designed not to have open comments on it. Well, uh, that is a Susan question. So can, can but we, we can go back to it. and yeah. we will get you that answer? Because I my understanding is there is that capability. I don't know whether it's part of this project, but we can find that out. Yeah, I mean, it's possible that the only mechanism for leaving feedback is through the existing um, surveys which have been designed with a fixed set of questions and you know maybe that maybe that's the way it was it's just I, I had some idea that there was going to be it was going to be the website was going to be uh, more interactive but I mean well I, I could also see um, and and we'll circle back with Susa but what I understand from from the way she set this up is that um, we have the ability you know she has the ability to um, uh, collate all the um, all the uh, results from a survey, but that there's not a it's not built in to process the individual questions like just answers like that. We don't have that, so we're going to look at. And beyond that, I just had a, I just had a, a, a number of comments. So one of them was that um, with regards to the community meeting on November thirtieth. I, I would be slightly concerned that the library might not be able to accommodate it. If like 150 people show up, then I don't know if there's a room in the library that can handle that number. Um, maybe that number will not show up, but if that number do not show up, then you know there's probably a lot of people who didn't get to participate. So one way or another, that strikes me as, as, as a question. Um, a second point that I had was that I think it might be possible to do more at the public library to to promote the master plan survey. Um, last couple of times I've been in, I, I haven't. I think there's just like a flyer on the notice board, but you know maybe there could be like some kind of stand or booth or dedicated terminal where people could fill out the the survey because you know the library is a is a is a place where a lot of people would come and interact and you know, it could be a good opportunity for to try to encourage participation. That sounds then, like a good, uh, that sounds like a good job for uh, Justin's intern. He can have office hours at the library. Yeah, potentially. And then just the last point that I made is I wanted to add, add my voice to those who say we ought to specify a deadline for uh, filling out the survey because as long as it's open ended, I think people can endlessly punt on on filling it out. Um, and 
you know, actually potentially compromising um, participation while at the same time hoping that by keeping it open, then, you know, you'll get more people. I think people need a deadline to focus their minds. I think it could be a deadline, could be something like Halloween, like it was in the entire month of October. And then you also have the, the, the results in time for the meeting on November 10th so that we can discuss some um, topics for the open house. And that's it. That's all I've got to say. Agreed. Agreed. I will say that I agree that it would be great to have more than not just the library, but other opportunities for intercepts where people can complete the survey. We will need to let SGB know so that they can change the setting that only allows one response per, per uh, IP address. Uh, which is how we prevent ballot stuffing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we'll have to discuss that. I'm getting an iPad uh, for that purpose. Um, Heinz Plaza has Wi-Fi. I think it's also going to be, you know, you could use it anywhere. Um, but that would be the intention is to go out there and have people do it right then and there, if at all possible. Um, and I, I don't want to take too much time, but Sam, I agree with you on uh, the concern for the library. Uh, you know, we want a lot of people, but that's not the biggest room. Um, but with the way it's structured, the three-hour kind of walk through at your leisure, I think we can make it work. Uh, you know, hopefully with with hundreds of people. And I think David had his hand up, then Kristen and Louise. Yeah, I I guess I um, I have a similar concern uh, that Sam was was talking about, which is how to get the sort of granular level of detail. And part of the concern is the volume of stuff that belongs in the master plan. And I wanted to suggest that maybe a way to focus um, effort on the areas that need the focus is to just realize, you know, the, the re-examination process really um, is predicated on the notion that planning, that master plan change is evolutionary. You know, that there's an assumption that the master plan that we have right now reflects a lot of the consensus in the community. And so the re-examination is often about focusing on where are the areas that need revision. And, you know, the areas that are okay the way they are, and I don't want to suggest that the format is okay the way it is, because I do think that we want to reformat, you know, the, the entire master plan, just so it's more readable and, um, you know, easier to use. But I think um, Clark Caton, you know, hopefully is really going to help us to narrow down and focus mm -hmm. on the areas where change is needed. And, and I guess that's gonna come out of the surveys, but once we see the results of those surveys, that's gonna really help us identify, yeah, you know what? The land use element is the one that really needs a lot of attention. You know, we redid the circulation element recently and we redid the, you know, we just did the green building and environmental sustainability element. But our land use element, you know, the densities in the central business district are way out of whack with our zoning. And, you know, like you say, Sam, you know, the Westminster um, property, you know, is ripe for, for redevelopment and we really need to identify what it's for. And so I ju I'm just making a plug. This is really a comment more than a question, but making a plug for the fact that it's really going to be helpful to this steering committee if Clark Caden Hintz can identify those areas where there's a sense in the community that we need to need to make the change. And then we can put aside all those other elements that are sort of okay the way they are, that are non-controversial, that can be processed in a in a more expeditious way. <laughs> Well, I, you know, just to pick up on that, David, I, I couldn't agree with you more. And while, you know, our knowledge of Princeton suggests things to us and our knowledge of, of working through the projects we've done with you already suggests that we have a sense of this. 
until we see the survey results and we and we discuss those with the steering committee, we need to confirm those. And it's and as much as we think we might know what those outcomes may be, we don't know it fully. Um, but I do agree with you that the the big enchilada, um, not just for this project, but in the terms of any master plan, is the land use plan element and the reconciliation of the two land use plans for the former borough and the municipality and uh, aligning that with some of the idiosyncrasies with um, density, with lot sizes, with uh, other initiatives. And I think when you look at the municipality as a whole, it seems incredibly large, but when you start breaking down the pieces and you start looking at existing land use and zoning together, you're gonna find, and I think you're getting to this, that there are these particular areas that are gonna require that kind of focus and that there are gonna be many areas that don't require that level of focus and that maybe it's a little massage or a little tweaking, but it's not gonna re result in something uh, dramatically changing. So I and agree. And we're gonna work, we're gonna to work to clarify those those issues as much as we can. Great. So, so. And I think that the members of this committee should be racking their brains. You know, while the results of the survey are coming in, you know, at, at least some of you and, and maybe all of you were chosen, um, you know, because you have special insight um, either to some aspect of the community or some aspect of how um, you know, Princeton is organized. Um, so, you know, you should be bringing to the table also those items that you think need some change. And, you know, maybe your thoughts won't be supported by the surveys and won't be supported by the rest of the steering committee. You know, may maybe your stuff is a pet project, but but I do think that all of that needs to get put on the table with Clark Hayden Hintz to sort of help um, define the project. I strongly agree with that. And I see Louise, you had your hand up. Uh, I'm not sure if that's for a current comment. And then Kristen's, uh, hand, Kristen's, Kristen's hand is, is, is flesh oh, okay. colored, so it's invisible. <laughs> okay, but Kristen first, then Louise, and then I see Jack uh, had his physical hand up. Thanks. One simple question. So after we set the meeting schedule, I had put November 23rd on my calendar as the date that we were having a meeting. I can assume we're not. I just want to make sure we're not having a November 23rd meeting. That is correct. That's the date. Okay. Giving. Okay. Um, and just following on the comments about process, um, you know, I, I've had on the sidebar here on my computer, the, the process that's outlined on the website. And I have to admit, I'm a little skeptical of, and still trying to figure out even after this conversation, So I've been through the sausage making of community master planning before, um, that we're gonna continue to do open houses and community meetings through the end of this year, essentially. Um, and then we've talked. We just talked about having committees. I I'm wondering where those committees become involved. And I'm just trying to figure out how we how we go from all this intake to actual material and output. And I, from prior experience, you know, I spent months and months poring over documents with Marvin Reed when we were writing the institutional element of the master plan um, about a decade ago. And I, I mean, I'm just trying. I'm confused of how we go from these conversations and the conversations with the community and the survey to the, you know, what we're going to put forward. And that that's not clear to me. Um, and then one other thing I just want to note, um, I was, I've been part of um, open house processes here at the university as part of our campus planning. And, um, you know, when we, when we did outreach about the campus plan back in, I think it was 2008 or so, I mean, we spent weeks thinking about what are the visuals that are going to be presented, who's going to be at each station, how are you going to take down the notes? For, like, we have to think about as a like, and I'm I'm just worried that no, doing that meeting on November 10th doesn't leave us enough time between the 10th and the 30th 
and who's going to be at these stations, who's, who, what are the visuals that we need to have there to explain to, you know, just community resident who says, I was invited to come, I, I care about my community, I want to come in. How is that all going to be developed in 20 days? Well, with your last question, um, we're, we're going to have the preliminary survey results, which is going to indicate to us what how we, what are the issues? And we're gonna talk about those. Um, in, in my mind, these, these visuals are going to be um, uh, diagrammatic maps, thematic maps that we are making. For instance, if we're talking about open space and recreation, where those existing facilities are, what they're called. If we're talking about community facilities, what the existing community facilities are. And uh, you know, if we're looking at areas, then it would be a little different. Um, we don't know yet, but there, we don't think in our mind that if we are talking about this in the beginning of November, that we're not gonna be able in two weeks to pull together the graphics to do this and to figure out how to man those stations. Okay, so, so CCH will pull that all together after that November 10th meeting. Yeah, so I mean, we may, we may be starting to pull it together even before that because we're seeing results and we'll talk about it on the 10th. Uh, about what we see as okay that just wasn't clear to me that that was that was thank you um sure. and, and i just i just want to reiterate um it's really important that we think about that open house that we have um you know do we need municipal staff experts in certain areas at certain stations are there um who who needs to be standing there that has expertise or can actually explain um you know, what it is that we're trying to gather in terms of information at each of these three to five stations. Mm -hmm. Thanks. So I guess it's my turn. I, I, I strongly agree with Kristen's last statement too. And, and the only other thing I wanted to say was to agree with one of Sam's comments um, about um, the interactive nature of the engagement hub. I just think it's really important that we have a way for people to offer up comments. Um, you know, you didn't ask specifically about this, but here's here's what I think you should be paying attention to. I mean, so, you know, some general comments and maybe there are, um, I don't know what the right way to do that is either with a portal where people can upload, you know, up to, five pages of something or or with a general q and I, I don't know I, i'm not suggesting yet another survey at all uh, but i really do believe that it's important that 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 engagement hub be um a repository for for people's comments that uh, you know beyond what we've asked them in polls thanks louise and i see emma and then christine um, I also wanted to back Sam's points about, I guess, the qualitative aspect of the survey in terms of, um, you know, subjective information from people filling out the survey. And I understand that right now it's a broad overview um, and that hopefully through these open houses or, you know, more detailed surveys, people can actually really present um, that like qualitative, maybe subjective information about their user experience of the town. Um, and so, because I remember even with the first survey, I ran out of a character limit and it was, all I wanted to write was like three sentences, but I only had the opportunity to put like 10 words. Um, so that was an, uh, an example of my own experience of feeling like I wasn't able to actually share one of my ideas that, of my hopes for downtown. Um, and I also wanted to point out that I, I know that, you know, there's people in town who have their certain ideas of Princeton future, for example. Um, but I, I want to encourage you to look at Princeton futures community meetings as a really, really good role model for what, um, you know, the consulting firm can actually put on in these open houses where it was, you know, it's still a, you know, a small sample of the community that shows up, although I actually am impressed by the, the number that shows up. I always under 
you know, uh, estimate who's the number that's uh, of people coming to participate. And I, there's always more than I expect. Um, but Princeton Future held a community mapping meeting where this is exactly what we were just talking about with this idea of where people think chain, uh, you know, areas of Princeton, like the land use is susceptible to change. And so that's something to look into for these open houses because individuals who are, you know, moving around <clears throat> Princeton and using, you know, the different parts of the town for different activities, um, you know, they have their own experiences and ideas of where, you know, change could happen. And Princeton Future, you know, we merely facilitated and observed. We didn't provide our own ideas and experiences, um, but it is a really good model for getting ideas that you wouldn't expect on your own of what, for example, Westminster property could become. So that's just what I wanted to state. Thanks. We have Jack in there. Uh, Jack? I see Chris, Christine and Jack. Go ahead. No, Christine, go ahead, please. Sure. An idea for an interactive way to get um, input. Uh, the university has developed an all our ideas tool. I think it's open source and you sort of pre-populate it with a couple of options that you can choose and then people get to add their own and then further people who respond get to, to choose between that. I know the state used it for its public feedback um, for uh, how the regional greenhouse gas initiative uh, funds should be spent. So it's something I think could be looked into to have a little more interactive feedback. Can you say that again? What of the... all our ideas. Thank you. We'll check it out. Yeah, and look on uh, the state's sort of Reggie site and how they used it for public input. And Jack? I hope I won't frighten you with my introductory statement, but may I step back just for a moment and perhaps be somewhat philosophical? I'd like to think it's philosophical from practical experience with the master planning process, but it may not be. So you're all at risk, here, here I go. In all of my experience with master planning around the world, and I don't submit for a moment that I am the master master planner, but I've been there and I've done that many times. It is absolutely inevitable when you bring together a, a group of people like us, conscientious, loyal citizens of Princeton. We wanna do something which we know is necessary today. It's extremely important that we do it well. We know that we, our neighbors, our children, all concerned are watching. And so we're here for all the right reasons. None of us, however, have ever worked together. We're not master planners. We've got to put something together for the first time ever, and perhaps forever in the, in the in the real world is a group. So it's not unusual. In fact, it's normal in the early stages, first, second or third, fourth meeting that Louise Wilson would very constructively step back and say, look, we need to think about how we're doing things. We need to think about how we've organized ourselves. It's crystal clear that we need to survey the community. We need to find out what people are thinking. And obviously surveys, however much we may criticize bits and pieces of them, they have a role to play. We need to create a process in which key sectors, key segments of the community can be approached, become contributors to what do you think? What's, what's going on that you like? Where are the problems? What are the issues? We're in the problem of, okay, the surveys are underway. Who are we gonna to talk to and how are we going to talk to them? And as a practical matter, we have to find a way to document our community. Data gathering is underway, that was the primer, but we need data on what Princeton is because at the end of this process, what we're trying to do, it seems to me, is describe Princeton, document it, put it together in a way that's credible 
for our decision making, but also for documenting for the community. And then we're trying to set goals or values around which measuring performance in the future and an action program can be implemented. So I'm moving Socratically from frankly, Alvin's point, which is in, in my mind, just a piece of Louise's point, shouldn't we step back a minute and just double check, okay, what are the specific actions that we need to do? Who's doing them? What's the time frame? And even though CCH has put together a program time dated, what, what we've learned today from one another is we're still not collectively clear. And the sooner we become collectively clear, the quicker, more efficiently, and more happily our discussions are going to go and we're going to get the job done. That's enough philosophy. Sorry to wax perhaps too long, but for what it's worth, that's, that's my experience. And I think we're making progress, but I think we need to step back. I think Louise is right. We need some kind of a call it a flow chart. We need just to rethink what are we doing? When are we doing it? Who's doing what? How does it hang together? How do we integrate it so that we're all comfortable in the meetings to come? But I, I just want to make clear, I, I wasn't suggesting that we should like pump the brakes. <laughs> um, oh. I, I, I'm all for, you know, forging ahead. And, and I, and I, but I, I, I think I understand what you're saying, Jack. And I do think that the exercise of, of creating a, you know, cross between a diagram and a flow chart, but some, you know, something that conveys, um, communicates uh, the process and uh, would, would be, you know, helpful to the general public and perhaps helpful to uh, members of this steering committee too. But I, I think today's conversation has been um, good. I mean, it, I, I think it has been anyway. Absolutely. All right, and it's now 3.56. Okay, I see David. Yeah, I, I just, I mean, this is a little bit inspired by Jack, but a couple of people have asked the questions about some committees that were forthcoming. And I, I didn't even see references to that in the stuff that I was reviewing, but can somebody speak to, is there some kind of a group of committees other than the BCCs that are going to be formed to be part of this process or is that not I think in last I think in the last meeting I suggested that there might be committees formed around certain key um, either elements of the master plan or uh, particularly you know the kinds of things that involved weeds that need to be dived into <laughs> um, such as and this uh, certain parts of the land use plan, such as, you know, density, where and how much, et cetera. But I, you know, don't have, you know, in my head, any kind of, oh, here's, here are the committees that should be formed by this date to look at X, Y, and Z. Um, I don't know how Michael and, and, you know, your team, Michael and Justin, I don't know how you all feel about that, but. Uh, I don't think any committees are imminent right now um, or, or subcommittees. Um, <clears throat> like Louise said, if we did find that, you know, all right, we get all this data back and, and it makes more sense to, uh, you know, put some people that specialize in, in this, particularly from this group uh, to parse through it. I, I think, you know, we, we could discuss that, but. Um, as of right now, while we're still kind of doing the outreach and this, you know, current information gathering, I don't necessarily see the need for it. Um, but that's not to say it, it might not ever happen. Can Michael, I, do you see the need for potentially for a committee to look at the climate hazard mitigation 
um, study plan that needs to be integrated into the land use element or are there things that that seem to you to sort of lend themselves to well a, a subgroup of this steering committee looking at and then coming back with thoughts about what's appropriate well i can say that we don't know what at least I can say that I don't know enough about what the issues are to to, to tell you right now that we need a, a subcommittee of this group that would focus on any particular issue um, where Justin is. That being said, if, if, they're, if in reviewing information and looking at survey results that there are particular things that, you know, you feel like there's two or three people that should be informing us in a much more direct way as to the as to what the policy should be and how to go through and get a draft document done that may be the case but i can't say sitting here today okay so and i think the other side of that is if you all feel that a subcommittee would be useful on a certain topic there's nothing that would prevent that from happening in the normal course of things Okay. Yeah, and I'll just add, uh, you know, I do think a thread that goes through a lot of what we've discussed today um, is that we do often have expertise uh, through our various uh, boards, committees, and, you know, task forces and, and whatever else. Uh, and a lot of times they're going it alone. So we really do depend on uh, the volunteer members to, to go above and beyond and to, you know, use that expertise. Um, whereas in this case, we do have Clark Kane hints. Uh, and their, uh, you know, skills and practices in other communities that we will feed them the the content, um, but they'll know um, a, a lot more how to do it than, you know, when we're when we're kind of working on things uh, from scratch. Can I can I just ask one tiny? I um, forget my ignorance on this. What are BCCs? That the boards, <laughs> commissions, and committees. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. No, yeah. not task forces though. Uh, no. <laughs> And uh, I see David, and it is four o'clock, so I do uh, hope we could wrap this up after. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I just, I think Louise's example of the uh, climate hazard mitigation um, component is a good example. And the other things that are, are being created new are probably deserving of consideration of having a small working group to start outlining them or something like that. And, you know, that's the economic development piece, which I know we've got a separate consultant working on, but hopefully there's uh, a group that can work with them to sort of draft that element. Because going back to my com my earlier comment about the this process being evolutionary rather than revolutionary, you know, for a lot of the existing elements, progress can be made by reviewing and marking them up and critiquing and, you know, and, and figuring out limited changes that need to be made. But for the new elements, I think we probably do need, um, you know, some, some focus from a, a working group or, you know, several working groups to help craft those new elements. And I see Alvin's hand up. Uh, very quickly, when we start to go down this route, I start to say to myself, we're about to be very Princeton, and we just can't figure out certain large <laughs> principles and things to work on. No, we gotta go. We gotta go through and beat it, you know, and beat it to death and getting it to this 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 detail. So, if we're gonna do this, this is just my warning that you know we we could. <laughs> I mean. We, We'll never get this done, or what we get done is in is in such finite detail that it it's not going to do much good. So that's my comment. Thank you, Alvin. And I think uh, this recent uh, these recent comments are a great place to end it and gives us something to think about before our next. Uh, thank you all for being here today. Um, as always, re reach out to me when if you have any questions. Elena. Three cheers, Alvin. <laughs> My to do Thanks. For Justin. That's why they call it sausage making, Alvin. <laughs> <laughs> sausage. You don't want to know what's in the sausage. 
I'm a vegetarian and I don't want to know. So. <laughs> and there's only one task bigger, Alvin, than doing things the Princeton way, which is changing Princeton. That's even harder. <laughs> yeah, there you go. <laughs> there you go. All righty. All right. I just All right thank you. Justin's going to nail down Bye -bye. The, for the next two meetings. I just want to make sure that, that we don't leave without. You that. said dates for the next two meetings? Well, the date on the time on the 10th and the date for a December meeting. Okay, got it. Okay. Excellent. Thank you all. Thank you.